Well, welcome to another Friday night. One of the things that I've been trying to do over the last while is to introduce some of the more subtle types of trauma and talk about them. So we talked about betrayal trauma. And today what I want to talk about is two types of trauma that many of you are, are going to realize you've experienced they're going to be maybe painful for you to, to think about and it's going to stir up some stuff, but they're all part of kind of the complex trauma umbrella. Um, and so we're going to talk about political trauma and war trauma. So uh, a book, if you're interested in, in reading and, and learning more about this, is Trauma and Recovery, The Aftermath of Violence from Domestic Abuse to Political Terror. And it's by Jude, Judith Herman. It's a wonderful book if you're interested in reading more about this. Let me begin with political trauma. Political trauma is really about kind of the structures and political situation of a society. And if they're not healthy they can add trauma to existing trauma. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you go through a trauma of sexual violence at work, or you're raped, or you experience racism, you're a black person and the cops just arrest you and mistreat you and you have done nothing wrong, or you go through domestic violence and nobody does anything about it, um, that's what we're, where we're starting. So that's the initial trauma and it's severe trauma. It's, it's, it's severe abuse, mistreatment, but then what happens? Now you get to the next layer, the political trauma, and that is where the justice system does nothing about it. They don't change the laws. They don't confront or punish or fix the situation with the police system and how they're handling those crimes. And so you experience the initial trauma, but now when you try to get that trauma resolved and addressed, you bump into the political structure, the justice system, and you end up with it not getting addressed, but it makes things worse. You now have trauma put on top of trauma. And, and so you experience a sense of betrayal by the authority figures. They're supposed to be there for me. They're supposed to keep our society safe. They're supposed to make sure that everybody is treated well and they're doing nothing about my trauma. So now you have betrayal trauma piled on top of the initial trauma. Well, if you decide to go, I need to get this this is wrong, I need to get this stopped, and you go public about it or you, you make a big stink about it and you try to get this addressed, what then happens is the authorities come in, the justice system comes in, and they give all kinds of distorted logic as to why they didn't deal with your situation. And often what happens with that is they'll try to twist it to make it somehow your fault that you brought it on yourself. So they take no ownership. They, they don't look at their laws as being wrong or unfair or the enforcement of those laws as being inconsistent and favoring only certain people. They twist it all and distort it and nothing gets happened. So now you've got another layer of trauma stacked on. You're bumping into not just authority figures that aren't doing anything, but a belief system that is twisted and against you. But let's say you're still not satisfied, and so you decide you're going to take this to court. And you're going to press charges against the person that raped you. And so you go to court. Now you're going to get a whole bunch of traumas stacked on to the existing trauma of rape. Because now you have to go to court and you have to retell that story over and over again. And they're going to challenge you on details. They're going to challenge your memory. They're going to cast doubt about things that you say. They're going to look for inconsistencies. And so you got to relive that trauma over and over again. Not in a healing environment, 
but in an unsafe environment where you're going to get more trauma added on. But then the defense attorney stands up and they attack you. They reveal every secret from your past. They tear you apart. They make it sound like you're a terrible person, that you have terrible motives, and it's all your fault. You brought it on yourself. So you just have had character assassination. You just have been raked over the coals. You've had every secret exposed, trauma after trauma after trauma. All of that because you're trying to resolve the initial trauma. That's what we're talking about with political trauma. And many of you have experienced it, and it just is heartbreaking when people go through this. But then you got another factor to all of this, and that is, do you realize that to change the laws about rape, about racism, about sexism, It could take generations before the political authorities decide we need to change the laws and make them more equitable. And so you see the problem, you're trying to address the problem, but you go through your entire life and the problem doesn't change. And it doesn't change in the next generation either. It could be several generations. So political trauma is slow when it comes to resolving it. It can take years and years before it actually changes. And so Johan Galtung, a sociologist, refers to this as structural violence, where the structure, the laws of society aren't fair to everybody. And they do violence. And that might be less obvious and seem different than physical violence. It might be, doesn't seem as bad as physical violence, but man, it is so harmful and so damaging. And so that's what we're talking about. So let me give you some examples of this political trauma. So racial injustice and racism, that's a, one we think of most as a political trauma. Women's rights. Women being treated as equal to men versus misogyny. That's another type of political trauma. Then you have all the LGBTQIA stuff with homosexuality, gay, and transgender, and, and the laws regarding that. Then you have domestic violence and, and how it's been treated in the past. Whereas women are just kind of property that, yeah, they deserved it. It's their fault. Um, they made the man mad, so they nothing should be done. Sexual trauma, rape, incest, and how that's been responded to in the past. So what I want you to see from that is political trauma always includes a group of people being oppressed and nothing is done about it. So there, this group of people is not being treated with the same rights as everybody else or the same rights as those in the political authority positions are getting. So there's a double standard. So they're not being treated, bottom line, with love. That, if there's laws that allow that, that is political trauma. And it is so devastating to grow up and live within a system like that where you're experiencing that because you feel so helpless to do anything about it. So that leads to the question, why does this happen? Where does it come from? So political trauma is always related to kind of a belief system within a culture. So the cultures developed a set of beliefs that either them being aware of or not being aware of, it justifies the abuse of authority. So one race is considered superior to others. One gender is considered superior to others. And they have beliefs that somehow 
justify or that's the way it should be. That's the right way is we're superior, they're inferior, and so they can be treated differently. So it's always coming out of a, a, a belief system that gets adopted by a culture. And that belief system can come out of often a religion that is pro prominent in that culture. And so everybody just thinks this religion is has a message from God and they're teaching this, so it's got to be right. But when you look at it, it, it's violating love. It's violating treating everybody the way I would want to be treated. Or it can come out of a philosophy that develops or a psychology that develops. And so everybody begins to adopt these beliefs without realizing they're damaging a small group of people. They might seem to be okay to everybody and not doing any pro causing any problems, but to one group of people, they're causing great problems. And so it's a belief system that results in this. So let me just give you one example. And this is probably the most common one worldwide, and that's patriarchy. And so the teaching basically is men are superior to women. That's what it boils down to. And so men should lead, men should rule, women have no rights, children have no rights, women are to be taking care of the home and the children usually, and they uh, have to obey the men, they have to take care of the men, um, the men make decisions for them, the men basically decide everything, and the women just accommodate, they go along. Th their greatest virtue is compliance. Are they submissive? And do they let men rule? And so men become leaders outside of the home, women never do. Men are bosses at jobs. Men are political leaders. And what begins to happen is that the laws are made to protect all of that, to make all of that the norm, as good, as given, as the way it should be. And so laws are actually made to protect men and let them live the way they want with impunity. And that, sadly, is how political trauma develops. So, if a woman is raped, instead of saying, that man who is physically stronger abused his power to subject a woman to something she didn't want, they would never own that. They would go, no, the woman wanted it. They twist it. The woman dressed in a way that was seductive. It's the woman's fault. She must have wanted it. So the man is never culpable. And so it's a system of laws now protecting men but never women. And because the woman has been restricted to just being in the home, she has no voice out in the community about the laws. Laws have no perspective from the from a woman's perspective. It's only from a man's perspective. And so that's why it's so hard to change it because a structure has been created that makes it hard for the oppressed person to gain a voice, to be able to add a perspective that is necessary to have fair, equitable laws. And so you can see that what would happen over time is that politics would basically become all about men protecting their own position and power and privileges. It's no longer what is best for everybody. It's only about what protects what I want. And that is how gradually you end up with societies that are great for certain people, but oppressive to other groups of people. But it's very, very hard to change that. So, to take that a wee bit further, what we're looking at is like a home, which I always refer to as the family box, the beliefs within a family, the values within a family, the unspoken rules about how you act and treat each other and look at different things. All of those are the 
the family box. Well, you also have a cultural box. And that is the belief system that guides the culture about how to see certain people, treat people, who's superior, who's inferior. That has to be deconstructed. No culture is perfect. Every culture has flaws. Every culture has some aspects where there's some political trauma happening. And so just be careful to say, I just want to be true to my culture. Because sometimes to say, I just want to be true to my culture, you're actually saying, I want to be true to stuff that's very unhealthy. If we're going to get healthy, we have to be able to deconstruct our culture and our belief system. And so that's where we have to start. And that's where we have to be able to go, hey, there's political trauma as part of my culture. There's a group of people in authority who've created laws that are great for them but are oppressing other people. I need to be able to challenge that. I need to be able to see the flaws in that for myself. That's where we begin. But then what else can you do? If you've experienced political trauma, you know it's hard to deal with this, to get any change to happen. So let me just give you a couple things that you can do. Number one, you can be engaged in some type of political protest, some type of joining with others to say, this is not right. This is hurting this group of people. And, and, and there's lots of nonviolent type of protests that do carry influence in changing laws. Secondly, you can be involved in educating others, making them aware that, hey, this is happening in our culture. This is, this is causing these people to be oppressed. This is not what a loving society should look like. And so you can be doing things in your just your area of influence where you're letting other people understand what the issues are. But let me caution you. Whenever you call attention to political trauma, you're calling attention to a group of oppressed people and you're exposing the political authorities that they're not enforcing an equitable system. You're exposing that they're not doing their jobs the way they should be, and they don't like that. And so often you're not going to get the response of, oh yeah, you're right, let's change our laws. You're going to get the response of, let's shut you down. You're going to get persecution and opposition, and they're going to put pressure on you to come back and adopt acceptance of the old system and make you think you'd be a lot happier if you just went along with the status quo. And so be prepared for opposition. And you might even get opposition from your own family who don't like you stirring up things. The next thing to be aware of, especially if you come out of complex trauma, is be cautious when you get involved in trying in a, in a cause, in trying to make people aware of a cause, in trying to correct social injustice. It's so important for those causes to exist. But many people that come out of complex trauma aren't strong enough to get into a cause like that and not be controlled by a cause. So they get into it and they become obsessed with it. They get into it and all of a sudden it consumes them and they start to neglect themselves. It almost becomes like an addiction to them and it has a very negative effect on them. They stop growing, they regress into old behaviors. And so just be very cautious if you get involved in a cause that your life stays in balance, that it doesn't become a consuming thing. The final thing I want to say about this political trauma is because it usually takes generations to change a political structure and laws within a culture. Don't expect instant results. Realize that 
you may spend your life working to try to make people aware of these problems, but nothing might happen. So you need to have a safe place within that culture where you get support, where you connect with safe people who understand, who support what you do, where you can find a surrogate family, where you can find your place. That becomes so important if you are going to be able to take care of yourself while you're trying to change things in your culture. So that's political trauma. Now let me go on to war trauma. And again, this might stir up some stuff for people. Sadly, it's a big part of our culture, um, our world today, what we deal with. We, we just live with refugees and hearing about wars and war-torn countries all the time. So I want to look at this from two perspectives. So number one, I want to look at citizens who are involved in being part of a war-torn country. So they got war happening in their neighborhood, going on around them, and bombs dropping and all of that, and they're just the victim of a war between powers within their culture. And then I want to look at it from the perspective of a soldier. So just to add to this, to your thinking, because you may not be in a war-torn country, and you go, how does this apply to me? Two ways. Number one, even in countries that would be characterized as peaceful countries, there still can be kind of war zones that you might grow up in, and that would be kids that grow up in gang neighborhoods. And that's like growing up in a war zone. There's a different set of rules. There's a different degree of whether you're safe or not. It is very, very similar to growing up in a war-torn country. So that's one thing. Secondly, when you look at what a soldier has to go through, it really correlates very closely with what happens for people involved in emergency measures type of jobs. So police, firefighters, um, ER doctors, ambulance drivers, all of those people are very much involved in war zone type environments. And so their life is very similar to that of a soldier. Now, as we go into this, let me just give you a context that might be helpful to you. And that is, a hundred years ago, when people started studying war and the effects of war, what they basically focused on at that time was physical injury. They didn't even consider emotional injury. That's all changed. But that's where people started. They, they just saw war as causing physical injury. People got shot. People got wounded in some way. They didn't look at emotional injury. And so we're going to go more into the emotional injury stuff because to me that is actually the bigger part of the injury that comes out of war. And that's what we're understanding, but it's taken us a long time to get there. So let me begin and just very quickly kind of go through war trauma from the perspective of a citizen. And I'm just going to touch on this. And if you are a person who's been involved as a citizen in a country torn by war, you can take this a whole lot farther in your thinking. And I don't want to do a disservice in any way by just highlighting some of the main pieces of war trauma. The first piece, though, would be you live in constant fear. If you got bombs dropping, soldiers marching down the street, it, it, it's just constant fear. And the toll that that takes on a person is huge. But then on top of that, you've got loss after loss after loss. You've got people you love that are killed. You lose your possessions. You lose your home. You have to flee to a different country, so you lose your culture. 
loss after loss after loss and major, major losses, just massive. Then because of the war, you are forced to live in very difficult, austere living conditions. So you may lose electricity, you may lose heat, you may not have any food available, so you're hungry. And then if you go to a refugee camp, you're living in a tent in very austere, harsh conditions. And so your whole living condition now goes from a more comfortable, where your needs are met, to all of a sudden this is super difficult. Every day is a challenge. It is very harsh. Then injustice is happening all the time because of the war. Soldiers are raping women. Um, soldiers are stealing stuff from you and just taking it and nothing is done about it. It's all done with impunity and you have no recourse to try to address the many injustices that are happening. And then you're living in the unknown. Is this going to end? What's going to happen tomorrow? It just constantly living in the unknown, which is so hard to do. And then for many, because of war, they get separated from their families, from their children. Their children have to go to a different refugee area. Um, it is just hard, hard stuff to go through all of those separations. And then for many, they are refugees and they escape to a different country. But then, though they're physically safe, in that new country, now they experience racism. Now they are looked at suspiciously by everybody because of, of where they came from. And so they go through a whole new set of issues and problems and discouragement in this new country that is supposedly going to keep them safe and give them a home. So that's citizen stuff, just to summarize it. And so war trauma is huge. And it, it, it's really complex trauma at the severe end of the spectrum. And, and so all the stuff we've done in complex trauma would really be helpful to people who've gone through war trauma. But let me come to soldiers, because to me this is such a, an important piece to understand. So we just looked at this political trauma, so you have a belief system in a culture, and many people growing up in that culture just accept that belief system as being right. They don't challenge it, they don't see problems with it, but then over time, those problems in that belief system begin to be exposed. And that would definitely be true when it comes to war and soldiers. So if you look at the cultural belief system about men and about soldiers, for many, many years it was accepted as being right, as being good, but war has begun to expose the flaws, the lies of that cultural belief system about men and about soldiers. So let me just break down very quickly some of those things. What were some of the beliefs about men? If you're a man, you should be strong. But what did that mean? It wasn't just that you're physically strong. It meant you should be emotionally strong. So women were weak emotionally, but men had to be strong emotion, emotionally. But what did that mean? Well, men couldn't show weak emotions, like crying, like fear. That's what was believed that a strong, healthy man would be like. But do you realize what that is saying? What that is saying is for a man to be strong, they have to be good at suppressing emotions. They have to be good at disconnecting from emotions. We now know that's not healthy. So the whole belief system was setting men up to be unhealthy in order to look strong. But then strength wasn't just about not showing emotions. 
Strength also was you shouldn't need anybody. You should be self-sufficient. Well, we now know that's not healthy. Then strength also meant you should never have to be open and vulnerable. You should always be closed and guarded and not reveal too much of your weaknesses and struggles and disappointments and hurts and fears. You you just have to put on the hard armor and look strong. So what they're really saying is for a man to be strong, he has to become less human. He has to shut down. That's what was seen as true strength. We know that's not true strength. That's actually weakness dressed up as strength. That's actually hurting the person to not be able to be human because they got to murder part of their soul in order to try to be strong. And so that whole belief system about strength has got some major flaws. The second thing that was required of soldiers was honor. And so that men would fight valiantly with honor. And that meant they would put their needs aside. They would act on behalf of those they loved and make great sacrifices for them. And so that has a lot that's beautiful about it. But hopefully you're going to see that that got taken too far because it got taken out of balance. So what what was required of a soldier? That in order to be successful, in order to be good at your job, you have to be extreme. You have to push yourself to the extreme. You have to shut down pain. You have to shut down alarm systems. You got to push, your, push yourself, push yourself, push yourself. So to be good, you can't be a balanced person. To be good, you always have to be doing everything 100%. What they're really doing there is glorifying success as being constantly in your sympathetic nervous system, always on guard, always with cortisol and adrenaline pumping, always going, always producing, extreme, extreme, extreme. They're glorifying being in your sympathetic nervous system. We know that's not healthy. But that's what was presented. So let me just give a little sidebar here. I find it very interesting to compare what's required of a soldier to what's required of an elite athlete. And to realize that often many of the same beliefs about success around what makes a great soldier are also true about what makes a great athlete. But there's a downside to it. And so if you are an elite athlete... It's just for you to be aware of some of the downside to being that extreme pushing yourself constantly, that there's a cost to that. Now, there's another aspect that was required to be a successful soldier, and that was your ability to conquer. So you had to approach life as there's a winner and a loser. There's a good guy and a bad guy. There's somebody that has to be conquered. But there's two issues with that that I want you to think about. Number one, that required seeing life in black and white. You're either good or bad. You're either the winner or the loser. Now, it's important when you're in survival mode that you have to see life in black and white. That's what a child has to do to survive. But that's not healthy in regular life to see life in only black and white. That can cause tons of problems. The second thing is, is in order to be a winner or a loser, you have to suppress love and empathy and conscience because I'm the winner. I got to defeat this person. So to defeat them, I got to hurt them. I got to even kill them. So I got to suppress all of my good love, empathy, conscience stuff. Again, that might be necessary in a survival situation, but that's not healthy in all of life to be shutting that important stuff down. Those 
love, empathy, conscience are so important to have if you're going to have healthy relationships of secure attachment. And so what I want you to see is for a soldier to be a good soldier, they often had to adopt a belief system and to engage in adaptations to make them a good soldier, but actually it made them more unhealthy as a person. It actually resulted in them having to hurt themselves, to become less human, to shut down key parts of themselves that were healthy. And so sadly, that is what's happened for many people because of that belief system around what makes a great soldier. So let me take this a little bit farther for you. So this, if you go back 100 years, soldiers were going off to war and that was the belief system. Men had to be this way. This is what a great soldier did. And that was accepted. That was thought to be right. But then all of a sudden, soldiers were coming back with PTSD or shell shock or whatever they were calling it. They, they were crying. They were shaking. They, 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 they were almost comatose or catatonic. And so how did people respond to this? Wow, they're not a good soldier. They're not a man. And so they got labeled as being cowards that you don't have any courage, that's your problem. Or they got labeled as having low moral character. You're, you, you must have some major moral flaw. That's why you're responding this way. You're a moral invalid. You're inferior to other men, and it must be a moral thing. Bottom line is they were told they were weak. They weren't men at all. So that was how PTSD was originally diagnosed. Why? Because of that belief system about how men should be. So then what did they, the authorities do when people came back with PTSD? So first they misdiagnose them and they do it in a bit, very pejorative way and, and assign them low moral character, cowards, weak. But then they try to change them. And make them strong. And so they use tactics to deal with this apparent failure. So they shame them. They tell them you're a loser. And they hope that by shaming them, it's going to make them want to get stronger. Or they punish them. They put them in solitary confinement. They beat them. They give them shock therapy. All supposedly trying to make them stronger. Or they threaten them, if you don't do this, then we're going to do this to your family, hoping that's going to make them stronger. But they don't let them talk about it. Because strong people don't talk about this stuff that's just weakness. And so that was how they responded to it. Now, if you look at that, what you begin to realize is that's kind of old strategies that were used in parenting a hundred years ago as to how to treat a child who's not living the way you want them to live. So they were basically taking another belief system about how to parent and applying it to soldiers to try to get them to change. But then what was happening inside the soldiers? How were they coping with all of this? So the main thing that was happening with soldiers that were going to war and they just couldn't handle it, it was too traumatizing, is they were dissociating. And so dissociation at various levels became a huge issue um, that came out of PTSD for soldiers. But then for those who are starting to get back into civilian life, most of them just felt alien to that culture. They didn't fit in anymore. They didn't think anybody understood them. Normal people definitely couldn't relate to their world. So they just felt like an alien within their own culture, an outsider now. Some would try to get acceptance and validation 
And they got it through rehashing their war stories. They would tell their war stories in bars and they would try to make them funny. They would try to make them so people were in awe, people laughed, people were entranced by it. And so they just regurgitated over and over again their war stories. That was their only way of fitting in and connecting. Some went so far as to look down on everybody. You've not gone through what I've gone, gone through, so you're even weaker than I am. You wouldn't be able to handle it just like I could. And so they developed this very negative, judgmental, condemning attitude towards everybody else and just up front wrote everybody else off as losers. So those were things that were happening subconsciously within them trying to cope with their pain. And so you can see the damage that it's doing to themselves, to their relationships. They're just fracturing and everything's breaking down. Why? All because it started with the wrong belief about men and how to respond to men who aren't fitting that belief. So much damage. Thankfully, over time, they gradually began to discover what was really going on. It was emotional trauma, emotional damage happening. And they began to find solutions that were helpful to people. And so what were they finding? That soldiers needed a safe place, a place where they could be authentic and open up and relax and be vulnerable. That would help them deal with all of the trauma of war. Part of that safe place is they needed to connect at an emotional level with others who had gone through similar stuff. And they could connect with safe people and talk about what they had gone through. And as they talked about it and were able to reprocess it in a safe and supportive environment, they were able to heal. They were able to get through it. That's what they began to find. They had a li an interesting observation that became significant in, in the overall understanding of war trauma for soldiers. And that is that not all soldiers got PTSD. So why did some go to war and come back and they were pretty good, whereas others came back with PTSD. What, what made the difference? And what they found was it related to their childhood. The ch soldiers that had secure attachment as a child and had healthy tools for dealing with stress and dealing with problems and, and were able to regulate their stress system well, they would go to war and they were able to have a connection to family at home. They were able to use their tools and not go to fight, flight, or freeze. But the soldiers that didn't have secure attachment growing up, that didn't have tools for dealing with stress, they would go to war and they had to go to fight, flight, or freeze. That was their only option. And so it all depended on, did they have complex trauma? So, there are two elements to this war trauma piece, especially for soldiers. They needed practical things to help heal. So they needed connection. They needed safety. They needed to be able to reprocess in a safe environment. That became such an important part. But there also needed to be an overall understanding that strength in a soldier does not mean shutting down and becoming less human. There had to be a change at that cultural, political level in belief systems. And that soldiers needed healthy environments where they could express their needs, where they could get their emotions taken care of. So that's political trauma. That's war trauma. Two very important types of trauma to understand, especially in our world today. I hope that's helped you. And if you've experienced that, I just hope it gives you some tools in moving forward and dealing with it. 
Well, that's the end of another Friday. Have a great weekend.